This is exercise 2 for uh, programmable logic controller class and in this example uh, we are going to have two uh, control scenarios explained. One is AND logic uh, that's AND logic that means the input number 1 and input number 2 both need to be present to get some control action. And now the logic encoded in the PLC in this case is that when both inputs x0 and x1 are present then it starts a timer countdown. This timer is adjustable by on-screen HMI interface and uh, you can adjust this to uh, pro almost any value but uh, there is a multiplier of 10. That means if I put a value of 50 in the HMI it means it will count up to 5 seconds. 100 will count up to 10 seconds so on and so forth. So this is pretty much the logic. Every, everything else remains the same as in exercise 1. Only thing in this case what we've done is the output Y0 is connected to the relay like before and the contact from the relay in this case drives a 24 volt DC lamp. So that means when we, when we engage this switch and this switch uh, we have our AND logic satisfied. X0 and X1 is on. It counts down to the timer value indicated in the HMI and then at the end of the timer value this relay comes on. So this is pretty much the exercise for uh, that we have to accomplish on the trainer. So we can choose the program that we want to uh, use for the trainer facility here by choosing program 2. And when we choose program 2, it's the same circuit that I was discussing with you on the whiteboard. So this is the place where we can have the timer adjustable. We can change it like this. For example, 40 means 4 seconds. And this is a display which shows that the timer value has come up or down. You can even see X0 and X1 terminals come on. And uh, in this case, we have now made the necessary connections from the PLC. Uh, X0 and X1 terminals are connected to these uh, switches here yeah this these switches here this is x0 this is x1 and we've also connected the output to the same relay the relay output normally open contact drives this lamp so if our logic is correct and if our connections are connect then at the one, once we manipulate both these inputs at the end of 40 sec or uh, 40 count time or four seconds we should have this light come on right and uh, uh, while I do that, you can even inspect the value and the presence of X0 and X1 signals here. So I'm putting the first switch on. Uh, that means X1 has come on. Now I will engage the second switch. And the moment I engage the second switch, you can see that the timer has started to count down. The re relay has come on and here my light has already come on. Yes. Uh, let, let us also take a shot of uh, the relay uh, of the PLC output there. You should be able to zoom in. So this is, this is X0 and X1 here and this is Y0 there. So that's pretty much the logic for program 2. Right, so this is exercise 3 where we are trying to use a PLC now for something that uh, we see fair as understand in a more real application. So in this particular case we're going to use the start button and operate some relay. This could be the relay of a pump for example. And uh, when we press the start relay the first thing that the P or the start push button rather at X0 the first thing that the uh, PLC logic does is it starts this <laughs> So the first thing that uh, the PLC logic does is when it sees the start button registering on the PLC it drives this relay on and this relay will stay on for about two seconds. Uh, so obviously the pump will start and uh, one auxiliary contact of this relay is feeding back information to the PLC through terminal X1 or input X1 and if this feedback does not come for a period of at least two seconds then it will stop relay R1. So this is a hold on feedback system that is used when PLCs are used to drive uh, main contactors of pumps and starters panels. So start button comes on, 
uh, drives this relay feedback from this relay comes on and make sure that the relay has actually uh, been given the start command if it does not see this then it stops this relay and of course to stop it you need another push button so here's the second push button which goes to x2 and if the relay is latched on then when you press x2 the relay goes off please note of course that uh, the stop button in this case is a normally open button and not a normally close button like we are used to in stutter panels so this is uh, exercise 3 feedback action of the relay too close also Katuna. yeah so, so we choose the program ready yes we choose the program from here by pressing program 3 and it goes pretty much and uh, shows you what's happening here so i've already made the connections uh, this is my push button here for start this is my push button here for stop that means this is x0 or I could make this a little bit more interesting for you so I could even write here x0 yeah and uh, this one is x2 that means this is my stop button and here I have x1 which is feeding back information to the relay so x0 goes on the y0 will make this relay come on contacts from the relay will feed back information to x1 and then the relay will stay running for as long as you want to when you want to stop the system you press x2 so i'll just give you a demonstration now uh, you can see from the plc screen that x0 is off now i start uh, by pushing x0 and the relay has come on and it stays on and uh, life goes on when you want to stop the pump you press x2 and the pump goes off now to demonstrate to you that the feedback action is actually working what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out this contact which feeds back information to the PLC and let's do the same exercise again so here we go x0 starts the relay comes on but no feedback and so x this thing has gone off again yes so once again we start no feedback action and the relay goes off so I plug it back again inside to make sure the feedback comes on and we do this exercise again and it should work now here you go that's really running and when I press stop button feedback so that's exercise 3 for you feedback action of the relay thank you Katuna. so this is exercise 4 in exercise 4 we are demonstrating uh, a very important feature in especially that of uh, timer application so there are certain type of timers which are called off delay timers uh, so in this particular case we are demonstrating that we have off delay timers and in fact we are going to use two outputs Y0 and Y1 and as you can see here uh, Y0 is connected to relay 1 and Y1 is connected to relay 2. Uh, these blocks that you see here are adjustable options uh, accessible from the HMI. So just like in the previous example 50 represents uh, 5 seconds and 80 represents 8 seconds but because they are infinitely adjustable you can change this to 80 and this to 5 so that changes the entire sequence of operation of whatever logic is required for the machine so in this case when both 1 and 2 are operated uh, then immediately the relays 1 and 2 come on together and uh, after the after either 1 is open or 2 is open from the input side then the countdown or the off delay function starts and at the end of 5 seconds this relay will uh, de-energize and at the end of 8 seconds this relay will de-energize so we will also examine that we change these values and see that the function gets altered uh, whether this relay is leading or this relay is leading depending upon these times so this is what exercise 4 is about off delay function of a timer or of a PLC driving two relays R1 and R2 so choose the function of the PLC from here program 4 and uh, this is our screen for uh, the same logic here we can choose the time function so in this case here I'm setting this one to 50 and this one to 80 which means 5 seconds and 8 seconds y0 output y1 output x0 input and x1 input x1 is already on so we'll make this off as well right uh, if you look down below I've already made the connections this one is x0 and this one is x1 the outputs y0 and y1 are connected to two relays here that is this relay and this relay so when I first put on the power like for example if I start the logic you will see that both these relays come on and let me give you the, the real effect so here, here goes I've already put x1 on 
and now I put x0 on so both the relays are on and this will remain on as long as the condition becomes stable now I will put off one of the uh, inputs and uh, the countdown begins so the end of five seconds uh, you should have one relay going on so this one goes off and the end of eight seconds the second one goes off yeah so let's see that on screen now so here we are again x0 and x1 are off I start x1 and I start x0 both the relays have come on and now I remove the action by putting off uh, the inputs the countdown has already started at the end of five seconds this relay has gone off at the end of eight seconds this one has gone off let's try to repeat the same thing by changing the times and seeing whether it actually works let make let's make this one 80 and let's make this one uh, 30 yes and let's try to repeat this experiment here we go x0 x1 and x0 both are on and we remove the input countdown begins so now this one should go off first yes it did and this one should go on later and it did so there you go guys uh, programmable off delay function of a PLC okay one moment you have to stop okay right so this is exercise 5 and uh, so far we have seen PLCs dealing with only digital inputs and digital outputs uh, so it was a rather simple exercise and uh, easy to troubleshoot uh, one of the things that has started to happen on board of late is to uh, let the PLC also handle analog information and uh, this is where actually the magic can begin so today here is an example of a, of a PLC processing analog data and for that we have uh, besides this basic DVP 14 SS2 module we have one module this module is a four channel analog module and uh, it's called the DVP 04 uh, AD AD standing for analog to digital converter it has got four channels of uh, input we are going to use only one channel each channel has three terminals V plus I plus and C so obviously this means it can handle voltage inputs it can handle current inputs as well uh, so when this PLC was first programmed uh, it was uh, uh, programmed to handle current inputs so we are going to make this PLC listen to a current input uh, here's how it how the real world application would fit in let's take the example of this tank and this tank is full of fluid it's an open tank the bottom of the tank is a pressure transmitter and you can measure the height of water level because the pressure is equal to rho into h into g obviously so the output from the pressure transmitter is going to be a 4 to 20 milliampere signal which we are going to give to the PLC and what we are going to do is we are going to generate three outputs y0 y1 and y2 of course i'm not going to elaborate how the electrical connections are uh, manifested because you've already done that in previous exercises so here i have a possibility to adjust uh, low level alarm some intermediate level alarm and a high level alarm each of this could be adjusted by inspection or by uh, by entering a value through the hmi so uh, when we, when we connect our 4 to 20 milliampere signal into the system you're going to see the tank level rise and fall depending upon the value of the current signal and also programmed here is uh, it's going to compare this value with each of these threshold values if it exceeds then this one will trigger y0 this one will trigger y1 and this one will trigger y2 so here is an example of how analog data can manipulate real world digital outputs you could use this to control a pump or to generate an alarm signal so when we operate this system with a current input you must always short the input V plus and I plus and then give the input current signal so just to make sure that we are doing things right we are also going to include an analog meter into the circuit and we must ensure the integrity of the direction of the flow of current so rather simple experiment for analog data handling so input receives 4 to 20 milliampere signal 
and we get three digital outputs. Thank you. So we start with experiment number five, and uh, this is the DVP uh, 14 SS base module. We have an additional DVP 16 module for extension of digital I/O, and next to this is the module that we are most interested in. And if you focus here, Mr. Katuna, then you can see DVP 04 AD written here. This is the analog module, and these connections for this module have been brought out here. So, like I explained to you on the whiteboard, this is V plus I plus common. This is not connected. V plus I plus common for channel 2, for channel 3 and for channel 4. So this can handle four channels of analog information. But we are interested in giving some information to channel 1 and seeing whether it registers data. In our case, when we give this input, which is a 4 to 20 milliampere input, it is supposed to manipulate outputs Y0, Y1 and Y2. Now while Y0 and Y1 are connected to the relay, Y2 is not connected. But we can inspect the output by looking at either the, the, the LED indications on the PLC or by looking at the HMI. Now you can use this experiment a little bit more creatively by taking the output perhaps from the pressure transmitter of our level trainer and giving this input here. However, for the sake of explanation, I am going to use what is called a current calibrator. This is a current calibrator and uh, like its name suggests, it can generate current signal. So in this case, I have an option to generate 100 milliampere signal. And I know that my position of 2 is 20 milliampere and position of uh, 0.4 is about 4 milliampere. So this generates a 4 to 20 milliampere signal, which I am going to give to channel 1. So like I said, uh, the output is taken here and it's given to V plus and to I plus because you need to short the two of them like I explained in the diagram and the negative is given to common. So by doing this I have already managed to make a uh, current signal input into the system and uh, I'm going to set this to 100 milliampere. Uh, put my current signal back like so yeah, I also need to choose the correct program from the HMI. It's already selected. Right, and let me see whether it generates any signal first of all. Yes, can you see? So, to make sure that uh, we are actually sending a 4 to 20 milliampere signal, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to stop this system and we're going to include another current meter into the system. So, to do that, we need to break this connection, and I'm going to do that for you right now. So we could use uh, this meter and I'm going to break the signal like I said. I'm going to take the output from this meter back. And we are going to return it back to the current calibrator. So that would be this one. Right, I have to of course also switch on the power to the calibrator. And here we go. So you can see now the meter is, reg is registering 4 milliamperes. So that's, that's clearly indicated by the zero level here. 100% would be 20 milliamperes, and you can see the tank is empty. Yeah, I have a comparative set point here, so I've already set this for, uh, in this particular case, 133, but as you can see, by moving the slider, I can make this adjustable. So I've adjusted this to roughly about 183. That means when the water level comes above 183, this low level alarm will go away. And this high level, uh, middle level alarm for Y1, I will adjust to above 600 and this one to maybe above, uh, I know, maybe we can make it about 700, yes. So I'm going to start increasing the water level and the uh, current signal is going up. You can see that it's increasing on the meter and also increasing on the display here. Yes, it's still about 90. I increase further, increase further and Y0 is already on. You can see this same Y0 is already on here. 
and we increase the current signal further and further and you can see that Y0 has gone off. That means the water level has crossed the threshold point of 183. Let me bring it down again to show you that Y0 will in fact actually come on again. There you go. So that's your alarm, Y0. We could use this output to connect this to the annunciator as well in an extended experiment. And we will increase the water level further. Y0 goes off. Tank level increasing, increasing, increasing. And it's now what? It's at about 392, 393. We need to go to 600 to get Y1 to operate. And very slowly, we are at 574. There you go. So that's Y1 operating, indicating that you have crossed a threshold value of 600. And the relay remains on. And we'll increase the value even further so that we can operate Y2 as well. That's Y2 operating for you here as well. So there you go. And at you can see in the meter, it's not yet 20 milliampere. That's why the tank level is not showing full. But if I make it 20 milliampere, it'll show full. Yeah, so there exactly is 20 milliampere. And we've got perfect calibration of the analog input. Calibration of the analog input is a function of uh, programming the HMI and possibly scaling the value or the raw data that it receives, in this case a 4 to 20 milliampere signal, through some interface like this. So just to complete the demonstration, I'll bring the water level down and you will see that uh, Y2 will come off first. There you go. And now Y1 will come off. And eventually as the tank level comes down further, we will have a low level alarm. There you go. So there you are gentlemen. This is at 4 milliampere where we should get roughly 0 liters. Yeah, there it is. Bang on target. So this system is perfectly calibrated and we have uh, the PLC manipulating analog data to give you some kind of digital output indication. Thank you. So exercise 6 uh, with programmable logic controller. Uh, this is about uh, using extension modules uh, to add to the functionality of a programmable logic controller. In this case, uh, we have ad added this module, uh, which is uh, the PT100 module. The, in the previous example, we saw already uh, how we can use analog information and process it <coughs> for voltage and current. So, if you need some other kind of uh, inputs, to be addressed by the PLC, such as PT100 or thermocouple, you need to put special purpose modules like this. These are called extension modules, just like this one. So this one is the DBP04PT. It handles four channels of uh, PT100 or RTDs. <coughs> so in this case, uh, what we've done is we've got channel one here, and this is L plus, L minus, and I plus here. This is connected to A. B and B terminals of the PT100. So B and B are of course common terminals. So this is for balancing out the Wheatstone's bridge. Uh, we have done this for two channels. Yes. And the PLC goes to, is monitored now by program, by exercise six. So if you go to program six, you can change the alarm set points of uh, these two channels and you will get uh, Y0 or Y1 depending upon one or channel two has deviated from maximum temperature which is also presetable from the HMI as well as minimum temperature also presetable from the HMI. Uh, this output is a digital output and then with this you can probably control a pump or send an alarm signal or so on and so forth. Yes, so uh, the basic logic is very simple. Uh, to show you that we can do other things rather than just temperature monitoring we are also displaying on the HMI screen a averaging function of these two values. So suppose the, the temperature over here is 50 degrees centigrade and 50 degrees centigrade over here also. I can calculate an average temperature over here display as uh, 25 degrees centigrade. Then it is possible that this HMI compares this 25 degrees centigrade with some preset value inside and generates output Y2. We are not doing this right now, but these are the possibilities 
of uh, temperature monitoring with programmable logic control. So let's see how this is done now. Change this to program 6 and the HMI is then going to display uh, channel 1 temperature, channel 2 temperature and the average of channel 1 and channel 2. At this point we can also show high temperature for channel 1, low temperature for channel 1 which are user inputable uh, parameters as well as for channel 2 high temperature and low temperature. Based upon this comparison we can either switch on Y0 or Y1 for channel 1 or channel 2 respectively. So this is only an interface screen. Uh, the PT module is here and this PT module again has been extended for you over here. So this is L plus, L minus and I plus it's forming channel 1. FG stands for floating ground. Same thing with channel 2, channel 3 and channel 4. So I have a PT100 sensor. This is a PT100 sensor that we have here and uh, if you can focus on this it says uh, PT 100 degree centigrade, 200 degree centigrade range. So you get PT 100s in different ranges and it's a three terminal device, three terminal device. It's basically A, B and B, three terminals and I'm quite sure you know what those are. So I'm going to connect this A here to L plus and B to L minus, another B also to I plus. Now when we connect this input to channel one, and if we try to observe, we can see here on channel 1 temperature, it's already starting to show some display. So this raw data which comes into the PLC can then be calibrated and adjusted to scale whatever engineering display you want it to. In this case, we are not going down to that level, but we are just showing you that uh, this display is now available. Also, I can set the channel 1 high temperature. I will set this for... Uh, 36 because this is 34 degrees and the low temperature for about 30 right so it's green this means everything is okay now there is no alarm now I'm going to increase this temperature by holding this device in my hand and uh, let's try to see what happens so here we are that's 36 we are on 34.9 and I hold this in my hand and I hope the temperature goes up. There it's going up to 35. Maybe it needs to be warmed up a little more. So let me try to excite this guy a little bit. Yeah, 35.1 and 2, 3 and also watch the channel output. 4, yeah the temperature is going up. Yeah, we can of course use a heating bath for this and that's your alarm so that's your high temperature alarm yes so likewise we could um, uh, also see whether the low temperature alarm works so this is uh, PLC using uh, PT hundreds for temperature measurement now at the same time as I speak with you I will also try to connect channel 2 uh, on uh, the system so that you can see the averaging function which we have and uh, you will understand that there are various possibilities when it comes to working with PLCs and with PT hundreds. So as I make the connection uh, you will perhaps see this value coming up on the screen. Give me a second. Okay. Right, so now I've connected channel 2 also and uh, you can see very clearly that uh, I have an average temperature which is the average of these two. So if you extend the same ideology or thinking to the monitoring of exhaust gas temperature or cooling fresh water, you can understand that there are many possibilities and you can also operate some digital outputs which means Y0 or Y1 or stuff like that which gives you an early warning indication of parameters that are not directly measured. Average temperature is a parameter that is not directly measured. So if some cylinder liner is not firing, you get a high exhaust deviation alarm. So this is uh, temperature monitoring with programmable logic control. Right, this is exercise 8 uh, in the programmable logic controller series at Anglo Eastern Ukraine. And uh, this is the most uh, interesting and most uh, recent application area for uh, programmable logic control. And this is to measure the speed and direction 
of a rotating shaft. Now, this is very crucial because today you have uh, engines or generators whose speed and uh, direction of rotation is measured by devices that we call incremental or rotary encoders. So these are very useful devices and uh, the most important thing about them is they are optically isolated from the mechanical rotating part. So they are mounted by means of an arrangement such that the shaft of this device is aligned with the shaft of the flywheel of the rotating uh, generator or main engine. Uh, inside the rotary encoder you've got uh, some kind of photodiodes and transistors uh, either in NPN or PNP format. You get them in certain uh, types, uh, open collector or uh, relay driven or line driver output. But more importantly, they generate for us pulses like this. You have A, B, A bar, B bar and Z. So, an encoder has got uh, certain specifications. For example, it needs first of all its own power supply. So in this case, we are using 24 volts. The second thing that we need to know is how many pulses will it generate per rotation. So while there are various kinds of encoders available in the market, uh, you can have uh, encoders which give you about 1000 pulses per rotation and it's called PPR or you could even have 2000 pulses per rotation but generally for shafts we like to use designers like to use something like 360 pulses per revolution or if you want a higher degree of accuracy then you can go for 3600 pulses per rotation. Obviously this number is chosen so that uh, uh, when you are counting the pulses you know exactly that uh, one rotation is over. Right. So uh, the point is that it is so designed that the output from A will switch on to high and low, high and low every time uh, the light is impeded by the disk inside. And if you can generate this kind of a pulse train uh, B will generate something that is perhaps 180 degrees out of phase with A. Now by, by doing this, by doing this, not only can we measure the speed by counting the number of pulses per minute, but we can also decide the direction of rotation or rather order, also detect the direction of rotation depending upon whether the rising edge of A comes ahead of B or the rising edge of B comes ahead of A. So this is a very important a new innovation that is used uh, very often in maritime industry. So using incremental encoders you can measure both speed and direction. It is also possible to measure position, the third most important factor when it comes to measuring anything to do with the rotating shaft. You can count the number of pulses and you can say that my position is 20 degrees from some reference point. This reference point is available with one pulse that is generated from terminal Z per revolution. So if you align everything to the Z pulse system, then you know that I am 20 pulse away from uh, Z or from the starting point. So I am perhaps at 40 degrees away from the top center. So this is a very, very interesting possibility. This is what lets us use rotary encoders for things like alpha lubricators or to decide the injection timing to advance, retard the injection timing if you can query them through some kind of an HMI device. So in this case, we are demonstrating for you today a little uh, shaft that we are rotating. It's got some teeth, but we don't need it in this experiment. We are driving this shaft by means of a DC motor. We are going to vary this DC voltage applied to it uh, to about 6 to 8 volts DC. And we are also going to change the polarity of that in another stage of this experiment so that we can change the direction of rotation of the shaft. What we are interested to see is the output of A is given to X0, the output of B is given to X1. And on my HMI screen, I should be able to measure the speed as well as some indication here that tells me that the direction of rotation has changed from forward to reverse. So we will do this setup 
run it with the DC motor, vary the RPM a little bit and see what whether we are detecting that change in RPM. And once we finish doing that, we will flip the polarity of the DC motor to see that this system detects the direction of rotation as now changing from forward to reverse. Thank you. Right, so we are talking about exp ex exercise 8, uh, speed and direction measurement using a rotary encoder. So this is the incremental encoder that we are talking about. Now while it looks so small, uh, in reality when it is mounted on uh, the ship's uh, main engine flywheel or generator flywheel for example, it is encased in a larger, uh, stronger housing so that it does not get damaged. So it's, it's actually very he heavy and bulky, but inside that, this is all you have. So you get them as hollow shaft encoders or you get them as solid shaft encoders. So this one is coupled by means of a flexible coupling to uh, this rotating shaft here. And the output of this encoder has been brought out here. So you can conveniently interface it. A, A bar, B, B bar and Z. The power supply of this is coming from here. So when you, when you power up this particular thing, you've already powered up the encoder. The output from A and Z, we are taking and giving only to the first two terminals of the PLC, in our case, X0 and X1. So if I move this a little bit, you can see very clearly, you can see clearly it's trying to count the number of pulses. And if you focus in a zoom in a little bit more, you will see that in every case, if I move in one direction, in every case, x0 comes before x1 and if I change the direction of rotation x1 comes before x0 this is why it can detect the direction of rotation yeah. the rest of the connections are quite simple you return terminal SS back to power supply x0 x1 and we're done over here we have uh, interface screen and uh, you can see the RPM again there is sudden programming and calibration that is required but uh, we are going to drive this shaft now by means of the DC motor behind and this is the point for the DC motor. So I have an external power supply which I am going to switch on and change the speed of the motor and you will see that uh, this RPM will go up and down. It will be for a particular direction and then we are going to flip the polarity of the DC motor and see that it detects a different direction of rotation. So let's, let's do this demonstration now. So here's the DC power supply and I put it on and I have the, I have the shaft turning, yes, and uh, please observe that on the PLC you cannot see any lights blinking because that's how fast it's turning, that's the resolution of the encoder. And if you inspect the HMI, you can see it's detecting about 168 RPM which is more or less okay and it's detection direction forward. So if I play around with this voltage of uh, the DC motor, I will be able to see a different direction there. So I'm just reducing the voltage now and you can see the RPM has come down a little bit. Yeah, if you focus on the wheel, you'll see the wheel is turning much slower than normal. Now I'm increasing the uh, voltage and obviously the RPM. So here we go. So we are now just above, above 200 RPM and we are in direction, forward direction. So I'm going to reduce this now and I'm going to bring it to a stall and then I'm going to flip the polarity of the motor. So let me keep this at around 6.6 .6 volts and so that you know that I'm not doing anything special, I'm just going to flip this motor direction.